Section number 12 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lewis. The Bottleneck. Down in a narrow, crooked street among other poverty-stricken houses stood a very high and narrow one, built of lath and plaster. It was in a very bad state and bulged out in every direction. It was entirely inhabited by poor people, but the attic looked the poorest of all. Outside the window in the sunshine hung a battered birdcage, which had not even got a proper drinking glass, but only the neck of a bottle turned upside down with a cork at the bottom to serve this purpose. An old maid stood at the window. She had just been hanging chickweed all over the cage in which a little linnet hopped about from perch to perch, singing as gaily as possible. Ah, you may well sing, said the bottleneck, but of course it did not say it as we should say it, for a bottleneck cannot talk, but it thought it within itself much as when we inwardly talk to ourselves. Yes, you may well sing, you who have all your limbs whole. You should try what it is like to have lost the lower part of your body like me, and only to have a neck and a mouth, and that with a cork in it, such as I have, and you wouldn't sing much. I have nothing to make me sing, nor could I if I would. But it is a good thing that somebody is pleased. I could have sung when I was a whole bottle and anyone rubbed me with a cork. I used to be called the real lark then, the big lark. And then I went to the picnic in the wood with a furrier and his family, and his daughter was engaged. Yes, I remember it as well as if it had been yesterday. I have no end of experiences when I begin to look back upon them. I have been through fire and water and down into the black earth and higher up than most people, and now I hang in the sunshine outside a birdcage. It might be worth while to listen to my story, but I don't speak very loud about it, for I can't. Then it related within itself, or thought out its story inwardly. It was a curious enough story. The little bird twittered away happily enough, and down in the street people walked and drove as usual, all bent upon their own concerns, thinking about them or about nothing at all, but not so the bottleneck. It recalled the glowing, smelting furnace in the factory where it had been blown into life. It still remembered feeling quite warm and gazing longingly into the roaring furnace, its birthplace, and its great desire to leap back again into it. But little by little as it cooled, it began to feel quite comfortable where it was. It was standing in a row with a whole regiment of brothers and sisters, all from the same furnace, but some were blown into champagne bottles and others into beer bottles, which makes all the difference in their afterlife. Later, when out in the world, a beer bottle may certainly contain the costliest lacrime Christi, and a champagne bottle may be filled with blacking, but what one is born to may be seen in the structure. Nobility is nobility, even if it has black blood in its veins. All the bottles were soon packed up and our bottle with them. It never dreamt then of ending its days as a bottleneck serving as a drinking glass for a bird. But after all, that is an honorable position, so one is something after all. It first saw the light again when with its other companions it was unpacked in the wine merchant's cellar. Its first rinsing was a peculiar experience. Then it lay empty and corkless, and felt curiously flat. It missed something, but did not know exactly what it was. Next, it was filled with some good strong wine, was corked and sealed, and last of all, it was labeled outside, first quality. This was just as if it had passed first class in an examination, but of course the wine was really good, and so was the bottle. While one is young, one is a poet. Something within it sang and rejoiced, something which it really knew nothing at all about. Green sunlit slopes where the vine grew, 
merry girls and jovial youths singing and kissing each other. Ah, life is a heavenly thing. All this stirred and worked within the bottle, just as it does in young poets, who very often know no more about it than the bottle. At last, one morning the bottle was bought by the furrier's apprentice. He was sent for a bottle of the best wine. It was packed up in a luncheon basket together with the ham, the cheese, and the sausage. The basket also contained butter of the best and various fancy breads. The furrier's daughter packed it herself. She was quite young and very pretty. She had laughing brown eyes and a smile on her lips. Her hands were soft and delicate and very white, yet not so white as her neck and bosom. It was easy to see that she was one of the town beauties, and yet she was not engaged. She held the provision basket on her lap during the drive to the wood. The neck of the bottle peeped out beyond the folds of the tablecloth. There was red sealing wax on the cork, and it looked straight up into the maiden's face and it also looked at the young sailor who sat beside her. He was a friend of her childhood, the son of a portrait painter. He had just passed his examination for a promotion with honor and was to sail the next day as mate on a long trip to foreign parts. There had been a good deal of talk about this journey during the packing, and while it was going on the expression in the eyes and on the mouth of the pretty girl, had been anything but cheerful. The two young people walked together in the wood and talked to each other. What did they talk about? Well, the bottle did not hear their conversation, for it was in the luncheon basket. It was a very long time before it was taken out, but when this did occur, it was evident that something pleasant had taken place. Everybody's eyes were beaming, and the furrier's daughter was laughing, but she talked less than the others and her cheeks glowed like two red roses. Father took up the bottle and the corkscrew. It was a curious sensation for the cork to be drawn from the bottle for the first time. The bottleneck never afterwards forgot the solemn moment when the cork flew out with a cloop, and it gurgled when the wine flowed out of it into the glasses. The health of the betrothed, said Father, and every glass was drained, while the young sailor kissed his lovely bride. Health and happiness, said both the old people. The young man filled the glasses again and drank to the homecoming and the wedding this day year. When the glasses were emptied, he took the bottle and held it up above his head. You have shared my happiness today and you shall serve nobody else, saying which he threw it up into the air. The furrier's daughter little thought she was ever to see it again. However, this was to come to pass. It fell among the rushes by a little woodland lake. The bottleneck remembered distinctly how it lay there thinking over these events. I gave them wine, and they gave me swamp water in return, but they meant it well. It could no longer see the betrothed pair or the joyous old people but it could hear them for a long time, gaily talking and singing. After a time, two little peasant boys came along peering among the reeds, where they saw the bottle and took it away with them, so it was provided for. At home in the forester's cottage where they lived, their eldest brother, who was a sailor, had been yesterday to take leave of them, as he was starting on a long voyage. Mother was now packing up a bundle of his things, which father was to take to the town in the evening, when he went to see his son once more, and to take his mother's last greeting. A little bottle had already been filled with spiced brandy, and was just being put into the bundle, when the two boys came in with the other, larger bottle they had found. This one would hold so much more than the little one, and this was all the better, for it was a splendid cure for a chill. It was no longer red wine like the last which was put into the bottle, but bitter drops. However, these were good too, for the stomach. The large new bottle was to go, and not the little one, so once more the bottle started on a new journey. It was taken on board the ship to Peter Jensen, and it was the very same ship in which the young mate was to sail. But the mate did not see the bottle, and even if he had, he would not have known it 
nor would he have ever thought that this was the one out of which they had drunk to his homecoming. Certainly it no longer contained wine, but there was something just as good in it. Whenever Peter Jensen brought it out, his shipmates dubbed it the apothecary. It contained good physic and cured all their complaints as long as there was a drop left in it. It was a very pleasant time, and the bottle used to sing whenever it was stroked with a cork, so they christened it Peter Jensen's Lark. A long time passed, and it stood in a corner empty, when something happened. Whether it was on the outward or the homeward journey, the bottle did not know, for it had not been ashore. A storm rose. Great waves, dark and heavy, poured over the vessel and tossed it up and down. The masts were broken, and one heavy sea sprang a leak. The pumps refused to work, and it was a pitch-dark night. The ship sank, but at the last moment the young mate wrote upon a scrap of paper, In the name of Jesus, we are going down. He wrote the name of his bride, his own and that of the ship, put the paper into an empty bottle he saw, hammered in the cork, and threw it out into the boiling, seething waters. He did not know that it was the very bottle from which he had poured the draught of joy and hope for her and for himself. Now it swayed up and down upon the waves with farewells and a message of death. The ship sank and the crew with it, but the bottle floated like a bird, for it had a heart in it, you know, a lover's letter. The sun rose and the sun set and looked to the bottle just like the glowing furnace in its earliest days, when it had a longing to leap back again. It went through calms and storms, it never struck against any rock, nor was it ever followed by sharks. It drifted about for more than a year and then day, first towards north and then towards south, just as the current drove it. It was otherwise entirely its own master, but one may get tired even of that. The written paper, the last farewell from the bridegroom to the bride, could only bring grief, if it ever came into the right hands. But where were those hands, the ones which had shone so white when they spread the cloth upon the fresh grass in the green woods on the day of the betrothal? Where was the furrier's daughter? Nay, where was land? and which land lay nearest. All this the bottle knew not. It drifted and drifted, till at last it was sick of drifting about. It had never been its own intention, but all the same it had to drift, till at last it reached land, a strange land. It did not understand a word that was said. It was not the language it was accustomed to hear, and one loses much if one does not understand the language. The bottle was picked up and looked at. The bit of paper inside was inspected, turned and twisted, but they did not understand what was written on it. They saw that the bottle had been thrown overboard and that something about it was written on the paper, but what it was, this was the remarkable part. So it was put into the bottle again, and this was put into a large cupboard in a large room in a large house. Every time a stranger came, the slip of paper was taken out turned and twisted, so that the writing which was only in pencil became more and more illegible. At last it was impossible even to make out the letters. The bottle stood in the cupboard for another year, then it was put into the lumber room, where it was soon hidden with dust and spider's webs. Then it used to think of the better days when it poured forth red wine in the wood, and when it danced on the waves and carried a secret, a letter, a farewell sigh within it. Now it stood in the attic for twenty years, and it might have stood there longer if the house had not been rebuilt. The roof was torn off, the bottle was seen and remarked upon, but it did not understand the language. One does not learn that by standing in a lumber room, even for twenty years. Had I remained downstairs, it thought indeed, I should have learnt it fast enough. Now it was washed and thoroughly rinsed out, a process which it sorely needed. It became quite clear and transparent, and felt youthful again in its old age. The slip of paper it had contained within it so long had vanished in the rinsing. 
The bottle was filled with seed corn, a sort of thing it knew nothing at all about. Then it was well corked and wrapped up tightly, so that it could neither see the light of lantern or candle, far less the sun or the moon, and one really ought to see something when one goes on a journey, thought the bottle. However, it saw nothing, but it did the most important thing required of it. That was to arrive at its destination, and there it was unpacked. What trouble these foreigners have taken with it, was said, but I dare say it is cracked all the same. However, it was not cracked. The bottle understood every single word that was said. It was all spoken in the language it had heard at the smelting furnace, at the wine merchants, in the wood, and on board ship. The one and only good old language which it thoroughly understood. It had come home again into its own country, where it had a hearty welcome in the language. It nearly sprang out of the people's hands from very joy. It hardly noticed the cork being drawn. Then it was well shaken to empty it and put away in the cellar to be kept and also forgotten. There is no place like home, even if it be a cellar. It never occurred to the bottle to think how long it lay there, but it lay there comfortably for many years. Then one day, some people came down and took away all the bottles and it among them. In the garden outside, everything was very festive. There were festoons of lamps and transparent paper lanterns like tulips. It was a clear and lovely evening. The stars shone brightly and the slim crescent of the new moon was just up. In fact, the whole moon, like a pale gray globe, was visible with a golden rim to the half of it. It was a beautiful sight for good eyes. There were also some illuminations in the side paths, enough, at any rate, to see one's way about. Bottles were placed at intervals in the hedges, each with a lighted candle in it, and among them stood our bottle too, the one we know which was to end its days as a bottleneck for a bird's drinking fountain. Everything here appeared lovely to the bottle, for it was once again in the green wood and taking part once more in merrymaking and gaiety. It heard music and singing once again, and the hum and buzz of many people, especially from that corner of the garden where the lanterns shone and the paper lamps gave their colored light. The bottle was only placed in one of the sidewalks, but even there it had food for reflection. There it stood, bearing its light aloft. It was being of some use as well as giving pleasure, and that was the right thing. In such an hour, one forgets all about the twenty years passed in an attic, and sometimes it is good to forget. A couple of persons passed close by it, arm in arm, like the betrothed pair in the woods, the sailor and the furrier's daughter. The bottle felt as if it were living its life over again. The guests walked about in the garden, and other people too, who had come to look at them and the illuminations. Among them there was an old maid who was without kith or kin, but not friendless. She was thinking of the very same thing as the bottle, of the green wood, and of a young pair very dear to her, as she herself was one of them. It had been her happiest hour, and that one never forgets, however old a spinster one may be. But she did not know the bottle, and it did not know her again. Thus people pass one another in the world, till one meets again like these two who were now in the same town. The bottle was taken from the garden to the wine merchants, where it was again filled with wine and sold to an aeronaut who next Sunday was to make an ascent in a balloon. A crowd of people came to look on. There was a regimental band and many preparations. The bottle saw everything from a basket, where it lay in company with a living rabbit, which was much depressed, for it knew it was being taken up to be sent down in a parachute. The bottle knew nothing at all about it. It only saw that the balloon was being distended to a great size, and when it could not get any bigger, it began to rise higher and higher and to become very restive. The ropes which held it were then cut, and it ascended with the aeronaut, basket, bottle, and rabbit. There was a grand clashing of music, 
and people shouted, Hurrah! It is a curious sensation to go up into the air like this, thought the bottle. It's a new kind of sailing, and there can't be any danger of a collision up here. Several thousands of persons watched the balloon, and among them the old maid. She stood by her open window, where the cage hung with the little linnet, which at the time had no drinking fountain, but had to content itself with a cup. A myrtle stood in a pot in the window, and it was moved a little to one side so as not to be knocked over when the old maid leant out to look at the balloon. She could see the aeronaut quite plainly when he let down the rabbit in the parachute. Then he drank the health of the people, after which he threw the bottle high up into the air. Little did she think that she had seen the same bottle fly into the air above her and her lover on that happy day in the woods in her youth. The bottle had no time to think. It was so taken by surprise at finding itself suddenly thus at the zenith of its career. The church steeples and housetops lay far, far below, and the people looked quite tiny. The bottle sunk with far greater rapidity than the rabbit, and on the way it turned several somersaults in the air. It felt so youthful, so exhilarated, it was half drunk with the wine, but not for long did it feel so. What a journey it had! The sun shone upon the bottle, and all the people watched its flight. The balloon was already far away, and the bottle was soon lost to sight too. It fell upon a roof, where it was smashed to pieces, but there was such an impetus on the bits that they could not lie where they fell. They jumped and rolled till they reached the yard where they lay in smaller bits. Only the neck was whole, and that might have been cut off with a diamond. That would do very well for a bird's drinking fountain, said the man who lived in the basement, but he had neither bird nor cage, and it would have been too much to procure these merely because he had found a bottleneck which might do for a drinking fountain. The old maid in the attic might find a use for it, so the bottleneck found its way up there. It had a cork put into it, and what had been the top became the bottom, in the way changes often take place. Fresh water was put into it, and it was hung outside the cage of the little bird which sang so merrily. Yes, you may well sing, was what the bottleneck said, and it was looked upon as a very remarkable one, for it had been up in a balloon. Nothing more was known of its history. There it hung now as a drinking fountain, where it could hear the roll and the rumble in the streets below, and it could also hear the old maid talking in the room. She had an old friend with her, and they were talking, not about the bottleneck, but about the myrtle in the window. You must certainly not spend five shillings on a bridal bouquet for your daughter, said the old maid. I will give you a beauty covered with blossom. Do you see how beautifully my myrtle is blooming? Why, it is a cutting from the plant you gave me on the day after my betrothal, the one I was to have had for my bouquet when the year was out, the day which never came. Before then, the eyes which would have gladdened and cherished me in this life were closed. He sleeps sweetly in the depths of the ocean, my beloved. The tree grew old, but I grew older, and when it drooped, I took the last fresh branch and planted it in the earth where it has grown to such a big plant. So it will take part in a wedding, after all, and furnish a bouquet for your daughter. There were tears in the old maid's eyes as she spoke of her betrothal in the wood and of the beloved of her youth. She thought about the toasts which had been drunk and about the first kiss, but of these she did not speak. Was she not an old maid? Of all the thoughts that came into her mind, this one never came, that just outside her window was a relic of those days, the neck of the bottle out of which the cork came with a pop when it was drawn on the betrothal day. The neck did not recognize her either. In fact, it was not listening to her conversation, partly, if not entirely, because it was only thinking about itself. End of section 12.
section thirteen of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas the steadfast tin soldier there were once five and twenty tin soldiers all brothers for they were the offspring of the same old tin spoon each man shouldered his gun kept his eyes well to the front and wore the smartest red and blue uniform imaginable the first thing they heard in their new world when the lid was taken off the box was a little boy clapping his hands and crying soldiers soldiers it was his birthday and they had just been given to him so he lost no time in setting them up on the table all the soldiers were exactly alike with one exception and he differed from the rest in having only one leg for he was made last and there was not quite enough tin left to finish him however he stood just as well on his one leg as the others on two in fact he is the very one who is to become famous on the table where they were being set up were many other toys but the chief thing which caught the eye was a delightful paper castle you could see through the tiny windows right into the rooms outside there were some little trees surrounding a small mirror representing a lake whose surface reflected the waxen swans which were swimming about on it it was altogether charming but the prettiest thing of all was a little maiden standing at the open door of the castle she too was cut out of paper but she wore a dress of the lightest gauze with a dainty little blue ribbon over her shoulders by way of a scarf set off by a brilliant spangle as big as her whole face the little maid was stretching out both arms for she was a dancer and in the dance one of her legs was raised so high into the air that the tin soldier could see absolutely nothing of it and suppose that she like himself had but one leg that would be the very wife for me he thought but she is much too grand she lives in a palace while i only have a box and then there are five and twenty of us to share it no that would be no place for her but i must try to make her acquaintance then he lay down full length behind a snuff-box which stood on the table from that point he could have a good look at the little lady who continued to stand on one leg without losing her balance late in the evening the other soldiers were put into their box and the people of the house went to bed now was the time for the toys to play they amused themselves with paying visits fighting battles and giving balls the tin soldiers rustled about in their box for they wanted to join the games but they could not get the lid off the nutcrackers turned somersaults and the pencil scribbled nonsense on the slate there was such a noise that the canary woke up and joined in but his remarks were in verse the only two who did not move were the tin soldier and the little dancer she stood as stiff as ever on tiptoe with her arms spread out he was equally firm on his one leg and he did not take his eyes off her for a moment then the clock struck twelve when pop up flew the lid of the snuff-box but there was no snuff in it no there was a little black goblin a sort of jack-in-the-box tin soldier said the goblin have the goodness to keep your eyes to yourself but the tin soldier feigned not to hear ah you just wait till tomorrow," said the goblin in the morning when the children got up they put the tin soldier on the window frame and whether it was caused by the goblin or by a puff of wind i do not know but all at once the window burst open and the soldier fell head foremost from the third story it was a terrible descent and he landed at last with his leg in the air and rested on his cap with his bayonet fixed between two paving stones the maid-servant and the little boy ran down at once to look for him but although they almost trod on him they could not see him had the soldier only called out here i am they would easily have found him but he did not think it proper to shout when he was in uniform presently it began to rain and the drops fell faster and faster till there was a regular torrent when it was over two street boys came along look out said one there is a tin soldier he shall go for a sail so they made a boat out of a newspaper and put the soldier into the middle of it 
and he sailed away down the gutter both boys ran alongside clapping their hands good heavens what waves there were in the gutter and what a current but then it certainly had rained cats and dogs the paper boat danced up and down and now and then whirled round and round a shudder ran through the tin soldier but he remained undaunted and did not move a muscle only looked straight before him with his gun shouldered all at once the boat drifted under a long wooden tunnel and it became as dark as it was in his box where on earth am i going to now thought he well well it is all the fault of that goblin oh if only the little maiden were with me in the boat it might be twice as dark for all i should care at this moment a big water rat who lived in the tunnel came up have you a pass asked the rat hand up your pass the tin soldier did not speak but clung still tighter to his gun the boat rushed on the rat close behind Phew! how he gnashed his teeth and shouted to the bits of stick and straw stop him stop him he hasn't paid his toll he hasn't shown his pass but the current grew stronger and stronger the tin soldier could already see daylight before him at the end of the tunnel but he also heard a roaring sound fit to strike terror to the bravest heart just imagine where the tunnel ended the stream rushed straight into the big canal that would be just as dangerous for him as it would be for us to shoot a great rapid he was so near the end now that it was impossible to stop the boat dashed out the poor tin soldier held himself as stiff as he could no one should say of him that he even winced the boat swirled round three or four times and filled with water to the edge it must sink the tin soldier stood up to his neck in water and the boat sank deeper and deeper the paper became limper and limper and at last the water went over his head then he thought of the pretty little dancer whom he was never to see again and this refrain rang in his ears onward onward soldier for death thou canst not shun at last the paper gave way entirely and the soldier fell through but at the same moment he was swallowed by a big fish oh how dark it was inside the fish it was worse than being in the tunnel even and then it was so narrow but the tin soldier was as dauntless as ever and lay full length shouldering his gun the fish rushed about and made the most frantic movements at last it became quite quiet and after a time a flash like lightning pierced it the soldier was once more in the broad daylight and some one called out loudly a tin soldier the fish had been caught taken to market sold and brought into the kitchen where the cook cut it open with a large knife she took the soldier up by the waist with two fingers and carried him into the parlor where every one wanted to see the wonderful man who had travelled about in the stomach of a fish but the tin soldier was not at all proud they set him up on the table and wonder of wonders he found himself in the very same room that he had been in before he saw the very same children and the toys were still standing on the table as well as the beautiful castle with the pretty little dancer she still stood on one leg and held the other up in the air you see she also was unbending the soldier was so much moved that he was ready to shed tears of tin but that would not have been fitting he looked at her and she looked at him but they said never a word at this moment one of the little boys took up the tin soldier and without rhyme or reason threw him into the fire no doubt the little goblin in the small box was to blame for that the tin soldier stood there lighted up by the flame and in the most horrible heat but whether it was the heat of the real fire or the warmth of his feelings he did not know he had lost all his gay color it might have been from his perilous journey or it might have been from grief who can tell he looked at the little maiden and she looked at him and he felt that he was melting away but he still managed to keep himself erect shouldering his gun bravely a door was suddenly opened the draught caught the little dancer and she fluttered like a sylph straight into the fire to the soldier blazed up and was gone by this time the soldier was reduced to a mere lump and when the maid took away the ashes next morning she found him in the shape of a small tin heart all that was left of the dancer was her spangle and that was burnt as black as a coal end of section thirteen
Section 14 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kanzaki Soul. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Angel. Every time a good child dies, an angel of God comes down to earth, takes the dead child in his arms, spreads his great white wings, and flies with it to all the places the child had loved during his life. Then the angel plucks a handful of flowers which they carry with them up to God, there to bloom more brightly than ever upon earth. The good God presses all the flowers to his bosom, but those which he loves best he kisses, and in kissing gives them voices, so that they can join in the great song of everlasting praise. Not all this was told by an angel as he carried a dead child away to heaven, and the child listened as in a dream. Then they soared over all the places in its home where the little one used to play, and they passed through gardens full of flowers. Which one shall we take with us to plant in heaven? asked the angel. Close by stood a tall slender rosebush, but an evil hand had broken the stem, and all the branches, full of large, half-open buds, hung withering from it. That poor bush, said the child, take it so that it may bloom up there in God's garden. The angel took it and kissed the child for its thought, and the little one half opened its eyes. They also plucked some gorgeous flowers, but did not forget the despised marigolds and pansies. Now we have enough flowers, said the child, and the angel nodded, but still they did not rise to heaven. It was night and very still. They remained in the great town and hovered over one of the narrowest streets which was encumbered with heaps of straw, ash, and refuse of all kinds. It was just after quarter day, and there had been various removals in the street, and bits of broken crockery, rags, and old hats were scattered about in every direction. In fact, everything which was unpleasing to the eye. Among all the rubbish, the angel pointed to a broken flower pot, and a few lumps of earth only held together by the roots of a large, withered, wild flower. It was no use, and had therefore been thrown out of the window. We will take that with us, said the angel, and I will tell you about it as we fly along. So as they flew, the angel told this story. Down in that narrow street, in one of the dark cellars lived a poor, sick boy. He had been bedridden ever since he was quite small. When he was at his best, he could just hobble once or twice up and down the room on crutches. That was all. For a few days in summer, the sunbeams shone into the front room for half an hour or so. The little boy would sit here warming himself in the sunbeams, and looking at the red blood and his thin, transparent fingers when they held them up before his face. Then it was said, he has been out today. All he knew of the woods in the first freshness of spring was when a neighbor's son brought him home a few beech branches. These he held above his head, and dreamt that he was sitting under the beech trees where the sun shone and the birds sang. One day the boy also brought him some wild flowers, and among them, by chance, was one with a root. So it was planted in a pot and put in the window near his bed. The flower was planted by a loving hand, and it grew, put out new shoots, and for several years it bore fine flowers. It was a lovely garden to the sick boy, and his greatest treasure on earth. He watered and tended it, and saw that it got every sunbeam it could as long as a ray could reach the low window. It grew into his dreams, and it flowered for him. For him, it spread around its fragrance and gladdened his eyes. Towards it, he turned in death when his heavenly father called him. He has had his place in the presence of God now for a year, and for a year the flower has stood forgotten in the window where it withered, and in the removal was thrown on the rubbish heap in the street. It is that poor withered flower which we have added to our bouquet, for it has given more pleasure than any flower in the queen's garden. But how do you know all this? asked the child in the angel's arms. Because... I was myself the little sick boy who used to hobble on crutches. I know my own flower, you may be sure. The child opened its eyes wide and looked into the angel's beautiful, happy face. And at this moment, they found themselves in God's heaven, where all was joy and gladness. 
The Heavenly Father pressed the dead child to his bosom, and it received wings like the other angel, and they flew hand in hand together. And God pressed all the flowers to his heart, but he kissed the poor withered wild flower, and it received the voice and joined the choir of angels who floated around the Almighty. Some were quite near, others again outside these in great circles extending to infinity, but all equally happy. They all sang the glad song, great and small, the good child and the poor wild flower, which had lain upon the rubbish heap in the dark narrow street. End of section 14. Section 15 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Butterfly. The Butterfly was looking out for a bride, and naturally he wished to select a nice one among the flowers. He looked at them, sitting so quietly and discreetly upon their stems, as a damsel generally sits when she is not engaged. But there were so many to choose among that it became quite a difficult matter. The butterfly did not relish encountering difficulties, so in his perplexity he flew to the daisy. She is called in France Marguerite. He knew that she could spay, and that she did so often, for lovers plucked leaf after leaf from her, and with each a question was asked respecting the beloved. Is it true love from the heart? Love that pines? Cold love? None at all, or some such questions. Everyone asked in his own language. The butterfly came too to put his questions. He did not, however, pluck off the leaves, but kissed them all one by one with a hope of getting a good answer. Sweet Marguerite Daisy, said he, you are the wisest wife among all the flowers. You know how to predict events. Tell me, shall I get this one or that? Or whom shall I get? When I know, I can fly straight to the fair one and commence wooing her. But Marguerite would scarcely answer him. She was vexed at his calling her wife. He asked a second time, and he asked a third time, but he could not get a word out of her, so he would not take the trouble to ask any more, but flew away without further ado on his matrimonial errand. It was in the early spring, and there were plenty of snowdrops and crocuses. They are very nice looking, said the butterfly, charming little things, but somewhat too juvenile. He, like most very young men, preferred elder girls. Thereupon he flew to the anemones, but they were rather too bashful for him. The violets were too enthusiastic. The tulips were too fond of show. The jonquils were too plebeian. The linden tree blossoms were too small, and they had too large a family connection. The apple blossoms were certainly as lovely as roses to look at, but they stood today and fell off tomorrow, as the wind blew. It would not be worth while to enter into wedlock for so short a time, he thought. The sweet pea was the one that pleased him most. She was pink and white. She was pure and delicate, and belonged to that class of notable girls who always looks well, yet can make themselves useful in the kitchen. He was on the point of making an offer to her, when at that moment he observed a pea-pod hanging close by with a withered flower at the end of it. Who is that? he asked. My sister, replied the sweet pea. Indeed, then you will probably come to look like her by and by, screamed the butterfly as he flew on. The honeysuckles hung over the hedge. They were extremely ladylike, but they had long faces and yellow complexions. They were not to his taste. But who was to his taste? Ay, ask him that. The spring had passed, the summer had passed, and autumn was passing too. The flowers were still clad in brilliant robes, but alas, the fresh fragrance of youth was gone. 
fragrance was a great attraction to him though no longer young himself and there was none to be found amongst the dahlias and the hollyhocks so the butterfly stooped down to the wild thyme she has scarcely any blossom but she is altogether a flower herself and all fragrance every leaflet is full of it i will take her so he began to woo forthwith but the wild thyme stood stiff and still and at length she said friendship but nothing more i am old and you are old we may very well live for each other but marry no let us not make fools of ourselves in our old age so the butterfly got no one he had been too long on the lookout and that one should not be the butterfly became an old bachelor as it is called it was late in the autumn and there was nothing but drizzling rain and pouring rain the wind blew coldly on the old willow trees till the leaves shivered and the branches cracked it was not pleasant to fly about in summer clothing this is the time it is said when domestic love is most needed but the butterfly flew about no more he had accidentally gone within doors where there was fire in the stove yes real summer heat he could live but to live is not enough said he sunshine freedom and a little flower one must have and he flew against the window-pane was observed admired and stuck upon a needle in a case of curiosities there they could not do for him now i am sitting on a stem like the flowers said the butterfly very pleasant it is not however it is almost like being married one is tied so fast and he tried to comfort himself with this reflection that is poor comfort exclaimed the plants and the flower-pots in the room but one can hardly believe a plant in a flower-pot thought the butterfly they are too much among human beings end of section fifteen section number sixteen of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april 6090 california united states of america fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas psyche at the dawn of day through the red atmosphere shines a large star morning's clearest star its ray quivers upon the white wall as if it would there inscribe what it had to relate what in the course of a thousand years it has witnessed here and there on our revolving earth listen to one of its histories lately it's lately is a century ago to us human beings my rays watched a young artist it was in the territory of the pope in the capital of the world rome much has changed there in the flight of years but nothing so rapidly as the change which takes place in the human form between childhood and old age the imperial city was then as now in ruins fig trees and laurels grew among the fallen marble pillars and over the shattered bath chambers with their gold enameled walls the Colosseum was a ruin the bells of the churches rang incense perfumed the air processions moved with lights and splendid canopies through the streets the holy church ruled all and art was patronized by it at rome lived the world's great painter raphael there also lived the first sculptor of his age michelangelo the pope himself paid homage to these two artists and honored them by his visits art was appreciated admired and recompensed but even then not all that was great and worthy of praise was known and brought forward in a narrow little street stood an old house it had formerly been a temple and there dwelt a young artist he was poor and unknown 
however he had a few young friends artists like himself young in mind in hopes in thoughts they told him that he was rich in talents but that he was a fool since he never would believe in his own powers he always destroyed what he had formed in clay he was never satisfied with anything he did and never had anything finished so as to have it seen and known and it was necessary to have this in order to make money you are a dreamer they said and therein lies your misfortune but this arises from your never having lived yet not having tasted life enjoyed it in large exhilarating draughts as it ought to be enjoyed it is only in youth that one can do this look at the great master raphael whom the pope honors and the world admires he does not abstain from wine and good fare he dines with the baker's wife the charming fornarina said angelo one of the liveliest of the young group they all talked a great deal after the fashion of gay young men they insisted on carrying the youthful artist off with them to scenes of amusement and riot scenes of folly they might have been called and for a moment he felt inclined to accompany them his blood was warm his fancy powerful he could join in their jovial chat and laugh as loud as any of them yet what they called raphael's pleasant life vanished from his mind like a morning mist he thought only of the inspiration that was apparent in the great master's work if he stood in the vatican near the beautiful forms the master of a thousand years before had created out of marble blocks then his breast heaved he felt within himself something so elevated so holy so grand and good that he longed to chisel such statues from the marble blocks he wished to give a form to the glorious conceptions of his mind but how and what form the soft clay that was moulded into beautiful figures by his fingers one day was the next day as usual broken up once as he was passing one of the rich palaces of which there are so many at rome he stepped within the large open entrance court and saw arched corridors adorned with statues enclosing a little garden full of the most beautiful roses great white flowers with green juicy leaves shot up the marble basin where the clear waters splashed and near it glided a figure that of a young girl the daughter of the princely house so delicate so light so lovely he had never beheld so beautiful a woman yes painted by raphael painted as psyche in one of the palaces of rome yes there she stood as if living she also lived in his thoughts and heart and he hurried home to his humble apartment and formed a psyche of clay it was the rich the high-born young roman lady and for the first time he looked with satisfaction on his work it was life itself it was herself and his friends when they saw it were loud in their congratulations this work was a proof of his excellence in art that they had themselves already known and the world should now know it also clay may look fleshy and lifelike but it has not the whiteness of marble and does not last so long his psyche must be sculptured in marble and the expensive block of marble required he already possessed it had lain for many years a legacy from his parents in the courtyard broken bottles decayed vegetables and all manner of refuse had been heaped on it and soiled it but within it was white as the mountain snow psyche was to be chiselled from it one day it happened the clear star tells nothing of this for it did not see what passed but we know it a distinguished roman party came to the narrow humble street the carriage stopped near it the party had come to see the young artist's work of which they had heard by accident and who were these aristocratic visitors unfortunate young man all too happy young man he might also have been called the young girl herself stood there in his studio and with what a smile when her father exclaimed but it is you you yourself to the life that smile could not be copied that glance could not be imitated that speaking glance which she cast on the young artist it was a glance that fascinated enchanted and destroyed the psyche must be finished in marble said the rich nobleman and that was a life-giving word to the inanimate clay and to the heavy marble block as it was a life-giving word to the young man when the work is finished i will purchase it said the noble visitor it seemed as if a new era had dawned on the humble studio 
joy and sprightliness enlivened it now and ennui fled before constant employment the bright morning star saw how quickly the work advanced the clay itself became as if animated with a soul for even in it stood forth in perfect beauty each now well-known feature now i know what life is exclaimed the young artist joyfully it is love there is glory in the excellent rapture in the beautiful what my friends call life and enjoyment are corrupt and perishable they are bubbles in the fermenting dregs not the pure heavenly altar wine that consecrates life the block of marble was raised the chisel hewed large pieces from it it was measured pointed and marked the work proceeded little by little the stone assumed a form of beauty psych charming as god's creation in the young female the heavy marble became lifelike dancing airy and a graceful psyche with the bright smile so heavenly and innocent such as had mirrored itself in the young sculptor's heart the star of the rose tinted more and saw it and well understood what was stirring in the young man's heart understood the changing color on his cheek the fire in his eye as he carved the likeness of what god had created you are a master such as those in the time of the greeks said his delighted friends the whole world will soon admire your psyche my psyche he exclaimed mine yes such she must be i too am an artist like the great ones of bygone days god has bestowed on me the gift of genius which raises its possession to a level with the high-born and he sank on his knees and wept his thanks to god and forgot him for her for her image in the marble the figure of psyche stood there as if formed of snow blushing rosy red in the morning sun in reality he was to see her living moving her whose voice had sounded like the sweetest music he was to go to the splendid palace to announce that the marble psyche was finished he went thither passed through the open court to where the water poured splashing from dolphins into the marble basin around which the white flowers clustered and the roses shed their fragrance he entered the large lofty hall whose walls and roof were adorned with armorial bearings and heraldic designs well-dressed pompous-looking servants strutted up and down like sleigh horses with their jingling bells others of them insolent-looking fellows were stretched at their ease on handsomely carved wooden benches they seemed the masters of the house he told his errand and was then conducted up the white marble stairs which were covered with soft carpets statues were ranged on both sides he passed through handsome rooms with pictures and bright mosaic floors for a moment he felt oppressed by all this magnificence and splendor it nearly took his breath away but he speedily recovered himself for the princely owner of the mansion received him kindly almost cordially and after they had finished their conversation requested him when bidding him adieu to go to the apartments of the young signora who wished also to see him servants marshalled him through superb saloons and suites of rooms to the chamber where she sat elegantly dressed and radiant in beauty she spoke to him no miserere no tones of sacred music could have more melted the heart and elevated the soul he seized her hand and carried it to his lips never was a rose so soft but there issued a fire from that rose a fire that penetrated through him and turned his head words poured forth from his lips which he scarcely knew himself like the crater pouring forth glowing lava he told her of his love she stood amazed offended insulted with a haughty and scornful look an expression which had been called forth instantaneously by his passionate avowal of his sentiments toward her her cheeks glowed her lips became quite pale her eyes flashed fire and were yet as dark as ebon night madman she exclaimed be gone away and she turned angrily from him while her beautiful countenance assumed the look of that petrified face of old with the serpents clustering around it like hair like a sinking lifeless thing he descended into the street like a sleepwalker he reached his home but there he awoke to pain and fury he seized his hammer lifted it high in the air and was on the point of breaking the beautiful marble statue but in his distracted state of mind he had not observed that angelo was standing near him the latter caught his arm exclaiming have you gone mad what would you do they struggled with each other angelo was the stronger of the two 
and drawing a deep breath the young sculptor threw himself on a chair what has happened asked angelo be yourself and speak but what could he tell what could he say and when angelo found that he could get nothing out of him he gave up questioning him your blood thickens in this constant dreaming be a man like the rest of us and do not live only in the ideal you will go deranged at this rate take wine until you feel it get a little into your head that will make you sleep well let a pretty girl be your doctor a girl from the campagna is as charming as a princess in her marble palace both are the daughters of eve and not to be distinguished from each other in paradise follow your angelo let me be your angel the angel of life for you the time will come when you will be old and your limbs will be useless to you why on a fine sunny day when everything is laughing and joyous do you look like a withered straw that can grow no more i do not believe what the priests say that there is a life beyond the grave it is a pretty fancy a tale for children pleasant enough if one could put faith in it i however do not live in fancies only but in the world of realities come with me be a man and he drew him out with him it was easy to do so at that moment there was a heat in the young artist's blood a change in his feelings he longed to throw off all his old habits all that he was accustomed to to throw off his own former self and he consented to accompany angelo on the outskirts of rome was a hostelry much frequented by artists it was built amidst the ruins of an old bath chamber the large yellow lemons hung among their dark bright leaves and adorned the greatest part of the old reddish gilt walls the hostelry was a deep vault almost like a hole in the ruin a lamp burned within it before a picture of the madonna a large fire was blazing in the stove roasting boiling and frying were going on there on the outside under lemon and laurel trees stood two tables spread for refreshments kindly and joyously were the two artists welcomed by their friends none of them ate much but they all drank a great deal that caused hilarity they were singing and playing the guitar saltarello sounded and the merry dance began a couple of young roman girls models for the artists joined in the dance and took part in their mirth two charming bacantes they had not indeed the delicacy of psyche they were not graceful lovely roses but they were fresh ruddy hardy carnations how warm it was that day warm even after the sun had gone down heat in the blood heat in the air heat in every look the atmosphere seemed to be composed of gold and roses life itself was gold and roses now at last you are with us let yourself be borne on the stream around you and within you i never before felt so well and so joyous cried the young sculptor you are right you are all right i was a fool a visionary men should seek for realities and not wrap themselves up in fantasies amid songs and the tinkling of guitars the young men sallied forth from the hostelry and took their way in the clear starlit evening through the small streets the two ready carnations daughters of the campagna accompanied them in angelo's room amidst sketches and folios scattered about and glowing voluptuous paintings their voices sounded more subdued but not less full of passion on the floor lay many a drawing of the campagna's daughters in various attractive attitudes they were full of beauty yet the originals were still more beautiful the six branch chandeliers were burning and the light glared in the scene of sensual joy apollo jupiter into your heaven and happiness am i wafted it seems as if the flower of life has in this moment sprung up in my heart yes it sprang up but it broke and fell and a deadening hideous sensation seized upon him it dimmed his sight stupefied his mind perception failed and all became dark around him he gained his home and sat down on his bed and tried to collect his thoughts fie was the exclamation uttered by his own mouth from the bottom of his heart wretch be gone away and he breathed a sigh full of the deepest grief be gone away these words of hers the living sykes words were re-echoed in his breast re-echoed from his lips he laid his head on his pillow his thoughts became confused and he slept at the dawn of day he arose and sat down to reflect what had happened had he dreamt it all dreamt her words 
dreamt his visit to the hostelry and the evening with the flaunting carnations of the Campagna? No, all was reality, a reality such as he had never before experienced. Through the purplish haze of the early morning shone the clear star. Its rays fell upon him and upon the marble psyche. He trembled as he gazed on the imperishable image. He felt that there was impurity in his look, and he threw a covering over it. Once only he removed the veil to touch the statue, but he could not bear to see his own work, quiet, gloomy, absorbed in his own thoughts. He sat the live-long day. He noticed nothing, knew nothing of what was going on about him, and no one knew what was going on within his heart. Days, weeks passed. The nights were the longest. The glittering star saw him one morning, pale, shaking with fever, arise from his couch, go to the marble figure, lift the veil from it, gaze for a moment with an expression of deep devotion and sorrow on his work, and then, almost sinking under its weight, he dragged the statue out into the garden. In it there is a dried-up, dilapidated, disused well, which could only be called a deep hole. He sank this psyche in it, threw an earth over it, and covered the new-made grave with brushwood and nettles. Be gone! Away! was the short funeral service. The star witnessed this through the rose-tinted atmosphere, and its ray quivered on two large tears upon the corpse-like cheeks of the young fever-stricken man. Death-stricken, they called him on his sickbed. The monk Ignatius came to see him as a friend and physician, came with religious comforting words, and spoke to him of the church's happiness and peace, of the sins of mankind, the grace and mercy of God. And his words fell like warm sunbeams on the damp, spongy ground. It steamed, and the misty vapors ascended from it, so that the thoughts and mental images which had received their shapes from realities were cleared, and he was enabled to take a more just view of man's life. The delusions of guilt abounded in it, and such there had been for him. Art was a sorceress that lured us to vanity and earthly lusts. We are false towards ourselves, false towards our friends, false towards our God. The serpent always repeats within us, eat thereof then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods he seemed now for the first time to understand himself and to have found the way to truth and rest on the church shone light from on high in the monk's cell dwelt that peace amidst which the human tree might grow to flourish in eternity brother ignatius encouraged these sentiments and the artist's resolution was taken a child of the world became a servant of the church the young sculptor bade adieu to all his former pursuits and went into a monastery how kindly how gladly was he received by the brothers what a sunday fete was his initiation the almighty it seemed to him was in the sunshine that illumined the church his glory beamed from the holy images and from the white cross and when he now at the hour of the setting sun stood in his little cell and opening the window looked out over the ancient rome the ruined temples the magnificent but dead Colosseum. When he saw all this in the springtime, when the acacias were in bloom, the evergreens were fresh, roses bursting from their buds, citron and orange trees shining, palms waving, he felt himself tranquilized and cheered as he had never been before. The quiet open Campagna extended towards the misty snow-decked hills, which seemed painted in the air, all blended together, breathed of peace of beauty so soothingly so dreamily a dream the whole yes the world was a dream here a dream may continue for an hour and come again at another hour but life in a cloister is a life of years long and many he might have attested the truth of this saying that from within comes much which taints mankind what was that fire that sometimes blazed throughout him what was the source from which evil against his will was always welling forth he scourged his body but from within came the evil yet again. What was that spirit within him, which, with the pliancy of a serpent coiled itself up, and crept into his conscience under the cloak of universal love, and comforted him? The saints pray for us. The Holy Mother prays for us. Jesus himself has shed his blood for us. Was it weakness of mind or the volatile feelings of youth that caused him sometimes to think himself received into grace, and made him fancy himself exalted by that? exalted over so many for he had not cast from him the vanities of the world was he not a son of the church one day after the lapse of many years he met angelo 
who recognized him man exclaimed angelo yes surely it is yourself are you happy now you have sinned against god for you have thrown away his gracious gift and abandoned your mission in the world read the parable of the confided talent the master who related it spoke the truth what have you won or found have you not allotted to yourself a life of dreams to your religion not a mere coinage of the brain what if all be but a dream pretty yet fantastic thoughts away from me satan cried the monk as he fled from angelo there is a devil a personified devil i saw him to-day groaned the monk i only held out a finger to him and he seized my whole hand ah no he sighed in myself there is sin and in that man there is sin but he is not crushed by it he goes with brow erect and lives in happiness i seek my happiness in the consolations of religion if only they were consolations if all here as in the world i left were but pleasing thoughts they are delusions like the crimson skies of evening like the beautiful sea-blue tint on the distant hills close by these look very different eternity thou art like the wide interminable calm-looking ocean it beckons calls us fills us with forebodings and if we venture on it we sink we disappear die cease to exist delusioned be gone away and tearless lost in his own thoughts he sat upon his hard pallet then he knelt before whom the stone cross that stood on the wall no habit alone made him kneel there and the deeper he looked into himself the darker became his thoughts nothing within nothing without a lifetime wasted and that cold snowball of thoughts rolled on grew larger crushed him destroyed him to none dare i speak of the gnawing worm within me my secret is my prisoner yet if i could get rid of it i would be thine o god and a spirit of piety awoke and struggled within him lord lord he exclaimed in his despair be merciful grant me faith i despised and abandoned thy gracious gift my mission into this world i was wanting in strength thou hadst not bestowed that on me a mortal fame psyche still lingers in my heart be gone away thee shall be buried like yonder psyche the brightest gem of my life that shall never ascend from its dark grave the star in the rose-tinted morn shone brightly the star that assuredly shall be extinguished and annihilated while the spirits of mankind live amidst celestial light its trembling rays fell upon the white wall but it inscribed no memorial there of the blessed trust in god of the grace of the holy love that dwell in the believer's heart psyche within me can never die it will live in my consciousness can what is inconceivable be yes yes for i myself am inconceivable thou art inconceivable o lord the whole of thy universe is inconceivable a work of power of excellence of love his eyes beamed with the brightest radiance for a moment and then he became dim and corpse-like the church bells rang their funeral peal over him the dead and he was buried in earth brought from jerusalem and mingled with the ashes of departed saints some years afterwards the skeleton was taken up as had been the skeletons of the dead monks before him it was attired in the brown cowl with a rosary in its hand and it was placed in a niche among the human bones which were found in the burying ground of the monastery and the sun shone outside and incense perfumed the air within and masses were said years again went by the bones of the skeleton had fallen from each other and become mixed together the skulls were gathered and set up they formed quite an outer wall to the church there stood also his skull in the burning sunshine there were so many many death's heads that no one knew now the names they had borne nor his and see in the sunshine there moved something living within the two eye sockets what could that be a motley colored lizard had sprung into the interior of the skull and was passing out and in through the large empty sockets of the eye there was life now within that head where once grand ideas bright dreams love of art and excellence had dwelt from whence hot tears had rolled and where had lived the hopes of immortality the lizard sprang forth and vanished the skull mouldered away and became dust in dust 
it was a century from that time the clear star shone unchanged as brightly and beautifully as a thousand years before the dawn of day was red fresh and blushing as a rosebud where once had been a narrow street with the ruins of an ancient temple stood now a convent a grave was to be dug in the garden for a young nun had died at an early hour in the morning she was to be buried in digging the grave the spade knocked against a stone dazzling white it appeared the pure marble became visible a round shoulder first presented itself the spade was used more cautiously and a female head was soon discovered and then the wings of a butterfly from the grave in which the young nun was to be laid they raised in the red morning light a beautiful statue psyche carved in the finest marble how charming it is how perfect an exquisite work from the most glorious period of art it was said who could have been the sculptor no one knew that none knew him except the clear star that had shone for a thousand years it knew his earthly career his trials his weakness but he was dead returned to the dust yet the result of his greatest effort the most admirable which proved his vast genius psyche that never can die that might outlive fame that was seen appreciated admired and loved the clear star in the rosy streaked morn seals its glittering ray upon psyche and upon the delighted countenances of the admiring beholders who saw a soul created in the marble block all that is earthly returns to earth and is forgotten only the star in the infinite vault of heaven bears it in remembrance what is heavenly retains renown from its own excellence and when even renown shall fade psyche shall still live end of section sixteen section seventeen of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Snail and the Rosebush. Around a garden was a fence of hazel bushes, and beyond that were fields and meadows, with cows and sheep. But in the center of the garden stood a rosebush in full bloom. Under it lay a snail, who had a great deal in him according to himself wait till my time comes said he i shall do a great deal more than to yield roses or to bear nuts or to give milk as cows do i expect an immense deal from you said the rosebush may i ask when it is to come forth i shall take my time replied the snail you are always in such a hurry with your work that curiosity about it is never excited the following year the snail lay almost in the same spot as formerly in the sunshine under the rosebush it was already in bud and the buds had begun to expand into full-blown flowers always fresh always new and the snail crept half out stretched forth its feelers and then drew them in again everything looks just the same as last year there is no progress to be seen anywhere. The rose bush is covered with roses. It will never get beyond that. The summer passed, the autumn passed. The rose bush had yielded roses and buds up to the time that the snow fell. The weather became wet and tempestuous. The rose bush bowed down towards the ground. The snail crept into the earth. A new year commenced. The rose bush revived, and the snail came forth again. "'You are now only an old stick of a rose-bush,' said he. "'You must expect to wither away soon. "'You have given the world all that was in you. "'Whether that were worth much or not "'is a question I have not time to take into consideration. "'But this is certain, that you have not done the least for your own improvement, "'else something very different might have been produced by you. "'Can you deny this? "'You will soon become only a bare stick.' do you understand what i say you alarm me cried the rosebush i never thought of this no you have never troubled yourself with thinking much but have you not occasionally reflected why you blossomed and in what way you blossomed how in one way and not in another no 
answered the rosebush i blossomed in gladness for i could not do otherwise the sun was so warm the air so refreshing i drank of the clear dew and the heavy rain i breathed i lived there came up from the ground a strength to me there came a strength from above i experienced a degree of pleasure always new always great and i was obliged to blossom it was my life i could not do otherwise you have had a very easy life remarked the snail to be sure much has been granted to me said the rosebush but no more will be bestowed on me now you have one of those meditative deeply thinking minds one so endowed that you will astonish the world i have by no means any such design said the snail the world is nothing to me what have i to do with the world i have enough to do with myself and enough in myself but should we not in this earth all give our best assistance to others contribute what we can yes i have only been able to give roses but you you who have got so much what have you given to the world what will you give it what have i given what will i give i spit upon it it is good for nothing i have no interest in it produce your roses you cannot do more than that let the hazel bushes bear nuts let the cows give milk you have each of you your public i have mine within myself i am going into myself and shall remain there the world is nothing to me and so the snail withdrew into his house and closed it up what a sad pity it is exclaimed the rose-bush i cannot creep into shelter however much i might wish it i must always spring out spring out into roses the leaves fall off and they fly away on the wind but i saw one of the roses laid in a psalm book belonging to the mistress of the house another of my roses was placed on the breast of a young and beautiful girl and another was kissed by a child's soft lips in an ecstasy of joy i was so charmed at all this it was a real happiness to me one of the pleasant remembrances of my life and the rosebush bloomed on in innocence while the snail retired into his slimy house the world was nothing to him years flew on the snail had returned to earth the rosebush had returned to earth also the dried rose leaf in the psalm book had disappeared but new rose bushes bloomed in the garden and new snails were there they crept into their houses spitting the world was nothing to them shall we read their history too it would not be different end of section 17section 18 of fairy tales from hans christian anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cal Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Girl Who Trod on a Loaf. I dare say you have heard of the girl who stepped on a loaf so as not to soil her shoes, and all the misfortunes that befell her in consequence. At any rate, the story has been written and printed too. She was a poor child of a proud and arrogant nature and her disposition was bad from the beginning. When she was quite tiny, her greatest delight was to catch flies and pull their wings off, to make creeping insects of them. Then she would catch chafers and beetles and stick them on a pin, after which she would push a leaf or a bit of paper close enough for them to seize with their feet, for the pleasure of seeing them writhe and wriggle in her efforts to free themselves from the pins. The chafer is reading now, said little Inger. Look at it, turning over the page. She got worse rather than better as she grew older, but she was very pretty, and that, no doubt, was her misfortune, or she might have had many a beating which she never got. It will take a heavy blow to bend that head, said her own mother. As a child you have often trampled on my apron. I fear that when you are grown up you will trample on my heart this she did with a vengeance she was sent into service in the country with some rich people they treated her as if she had been their own child and dressed her in the same style she grew prettier and prettier but her pride grew too when she had been with them a year 
her employer said to her, You ought to go home to see your parents, little Inger. So she went, but she went to show herself only, so that they might see how grand she was. When she got to the town gates, and saw the young men and maids gossiping around the pond, and her mother sitting among them with a bundle of sticks she had picked up in the woods, Inger turned away. She was ashamed that one so fine as herself should have such a ragged old woman who picked up sticks for her mother. She was not a bit sorry that she had turned back, only angry. Another half year passed. Little Inger, you really ought to go and see your old parents, said her mistress. Here is a large loaf of wheat and bread you may take to them. They will be pleased to see you. Inger put on all her best clothes and her fine new shoes. She held up her skirts and picked her steps carefully as to keep her shoes nice and clean. Now no one could blame her for this, but when she came to the path through the marsh, a great part of it was wet and muddy, and she threw the loaf into the mud for a stepping stone to get over it with dry shoes. As she stood there with one foot on the loaf and was lifting up the other for the next step, the loaf sank deeper and deeper with her until it entirely disappeared nothing was to be seen but a black bubbling pool now this is a story but what had become of her she went down to the marsh wife who has a brewery down there the marsh wife is own sister to the elf king and aunt to the elf maidens who are well enough known they have had verses written about them and pictures painted but all that people know about the marsh wife is that when the mist rises over the meadows in the summer she is at her brewing it was into this brewery that little inger fell and no one can stand being there long a scavenger's cart is sweet compared to the marsh wife's brewery the smell from the barrels is enough to turn people faint and the barrels are so close together that no one can pass between them but wherever there is a little chink it is filled with some noisome toads and slimy snakes little inger fell among all this horrid loving filth it was so icy cold that she shuddered from head to foot and her limbs grew quite stiff the loaf stuck to her feet and it drew her down just as an amber button draws a bit of straw the marsh wife was at home old bogey and his great-grandmother were paying her a visit the great-grandmother is a very venomous old woman and she is never idle she never goes out without her work and she had it with her today too she was busily making gad about leather to put into people's shoes so that the wearer might have no rest she embroidered lies and strung together all the idle words which fell to the ground to make mischief of them oh yes old great-grandmother can knit and embroider in the fine style as soon as she saw little inger she put up her eyeglass and looked at her through it that girl has got something in her she said I should like to have her as a remembrance of my visit. She would make a very good statue in my great-grandson's outer corridor. So Inger was given to her, and this is how she got to Bogey Land. People don't always get there by such a direct route, though it is easy enough to get there in more roundabout ways. What a never-ending corridor that was to be sure. It made one giddy to look either backwards or forward. Here stood an anonymous crew waiting for the door of mercy to be opened, but long might they wait. Great, fat, sprawling spiders spun webs of a thousand years round and round their feet, and these webs were like footscrews and held them in a vice, or as though bound with a copper chain. Besides, there was such everlasting unrest in every soul, the unrest of torment. The miser had forgotten the key of his money chest. He knew he had left it sticking in the lock, but it would take far too long to enumerate all the various tortures here. Inger experienced the torture of standing like a statue with a loaf tied to her feet. This is what comes of trying to keep one's feet clean, she said to herself. Look how they stare at me. They did indeed stare at her. All their evil passion shone out of their eyes and spoke without words from their lips. They were a terrible sight. It must be a pleasure to look at me, thought Inger, for I have a pretty face and nice clothes. And then she turned her eyes to look at them. Her neck was too stiff, but oh, how dirty she had got in the marsh wife's brewery. She had never thought of that. Her clothes were covered with slime, 
a snake had gotten among her hair and hung dangling down her back a toad looked out of every fold in her dress croaking like an athematic pug dog it was most unpleasant but all the others down there looked frightful too was her consolation worse than anything was the terrible hunger she felt and she could not stoop down to break a bit of bread off the loaf she was standing on no her back had stiffened her arms and hands had stiffened and her whole body was like a pillar of stone she could only turn her eyes but she could turn them right around so as to look backward and what a horrid sight it was and then came the flies they crept upon her eyes and however much she winked they would not fly away they could not for she had pulled off their wings and made creeping insects of them that was indeed a torment added to her gnawing hunger she seemed at last to be absolutely empty if this is to go on long i shan't be able to bear it she said but it did go on and bear it she must then a scalding tear fell upon her forehead it trickled down her face and bosom right down to the loaf then another fell and another till there was a perfect shower who was crying for little inger had she not a mother on earth tears of torment shed by a mother will always reach it but they do not bring healing they burn and make the torment fifty times worse then this terrible hunger again and she not able to get the bread under her feet she felt at last as if she had been feeding upon herself and had become a mere hollow reed which conducts every sound she distinctly heard everything that was said on earth about herself and she heard nothing but hard words certainly her mother wept bitterly and sorrowfully but at the same time she said pride goes before a fall there was your misfortune inger how you have grieved your mother her mother and everyone on earth knew all about her sin how she had stepped upon the loaf and sunk down under the earth and so was lost the cowherd had told them so much he had seen it himself from the hillock where he was standing how you have grieved your mother inger said the poor woman but then i always said you would oh that i had never been born thought inger then i should have been much better off my mother's tears are no good now she heard the good people her employers who had been like parents to her talking about her she was a sinful child they said she did not value the gifts of god but trod them under her foot she will find it hard to open the door of mercy they ought to have brought me up better thought inger they should have knocked the nonsense out of me if it was there she heard that a song had been written about her and sung all over the country the arrogant girl who trod on a loaf to keep her shoes clean that i should hear that old story so often and have to suffer so much for it thought inger the others ought to be punished for their sins too said inger there would be plenty to punish oh how i am being tormented and her heart grew harder than her outer shell nobody will ever get any better in this company and i won't be any better look how they are all staring at me her heart was full of anger and malice towards everyone now they have got something to talk about up there oh this torture she heard people telling her story to children and the little ones always called her wicked anger and she was so naughty that she had to be tormented she heard nothing but hard words from the children's mouths but one day when anger and hunger were gnawing at her hollow shell she heard her name mentioned and her story being told to an innocent child a little girl and a little creature burst into tears at the story of proud vain anger but will she ever come up here again asked the child and the answer was she will never come up again but if she was to ask pardon and promise never to do it again she won't ask pardon i said but i want her to do it said the little girl who refused to be comforted i will get my doll's house if she may only come up again it is so dreadful for poor inger those words reached down into inger's heart and they seemed to do her good it was the first time that any one said poor inger without adding anything about her misdeeds a little innocent child was weeping and praying for her and it made her feel quite odd she would have liked to cry herself but she could not shed a tear and this was a further torment 
as the years passed above so they went on below without any change she seldomer heard sounds from above and she was less talked about but one day she was aware of a sigh anger anger what a grief you have been to me but i always knew you would it was her mother who was dying occasionally she heard her name mentioned by her old employers and the gentlest words her mistress used were shall i ever see you again anger one never knows whither one may go but anger knew very well that her good kindly mistress could never come to the place where she was again a long bitter period passed then anger again heard her name pronounced and she saw above her head what seemed to be two bright stars they were in fact two kind eyes which were closing on earth so many years had gone by since the little girl had cried so bitterly at the story of poor anger that the child had grown to be an old woman whom the lord was now calling to himself in the last hour when one's whole life comes back to one she remembered how as a little child she had wept bitter tears at the story of anger the impression was so clear to the old woman in the hour of death that she exclaimed aloud o oh lord may i not like anger have trodden on thy blessed gifts without thinking and may i not also have nourished pride in my heart but in thy mercy thou didst not let me fall forsake me not now in my last hour the old woman's eyes closed and the eyes of her soul were open to see the hidden things and as inger had been so vividly present in her last thoughts she saw now how deep she had sank and at the sight she burst into tears then she stood in the kingdom of heaven as a child weeping for poor inger her tears and prayers echoed into the hollow empty shell which surrounded the imprisoned tortured soul and it was quite overwhelmed by all this unexpected love from above an angel of god weeping over her why was this vouchsafed to her the tortured soul recalled very earthly action it had ever performed and at last it melted into tears in a way inger had never done she was filled with grief for herself it seemed as though the gate of mercy could never be opened to her but as in humble contrition she acknowledged this a ray of light shone into the gulf of destruction the strength of the ray was far greater than that of the sunbeam which melts a snowman built up by the boys in the garden and sooner much sooner than a snowflake melts on the warm lips of a child did inger's stony form dissolve before it and a little bird with lightning speed winged its way to the upper world it was terribly shy and afraid of everything it was ashamed of itself and afraid to meet the eye of any living being so it hastily sought shelter in a chink in the wall there it cowered shuddering in every limb it could not utter a sound for it had no voice it sat for a long time before it could survey calmly all the wonders around yes they were wonders indeed the air was so sweet and fresh the moon shone on brightly the trees and bushes were so fragrant and then the comfort of it all its feathers were so clean and dainty how all creation spoke of love and beauty the bird would gladly have sung aloud all those thoughts stirring in its breast but it had not the power gladly would it have carolled as do the cuckoos and nightingales in the summer the good god who hears a voiceless hymn of praise even of a worm was also aware of the psalm of thanksgiving trembling in the breast of the bird as the psalms of david echoed in a heart before they shaped themselves into words and melody these thoughts and these voiceless songs grew and swelled for weeks they must have an outlet and at the first attempt at a good deed this would be found then came the holy christmas feast the peasants raised a pole against a wall and tied a sheaf of oats on to the top so that little birds might have a good meal on the happy christmas day the sun rose bright and shone upon the sheaf of oats and a twittering bird surrounded the pole then from the chink in the wall came a feeble tweet tweet the swelling thoughts of the bird had found a voice and this faint twitter was its hymn of praise the thought of a good deed was awakened and the bird flew out of its hiding place in the kingdom of heaven 
This bird was well known. It was a very hard winter, and all the water had thick ice over it. The birds and wild creatures had great difficulty in finding food. The little bird flew along the highways, finding here and there in the tracks of the sledges a grain of corn. At the baiting places it also found a few morsels of bread, of which it would only eat a crumb, and gave the rest to other starving sparrows, which it called up. Then it flew into the town and peeped about. Wherever a loving hand had strewn bread crumbs for the birds, it only ate one crumb and gave the rest away. In the course of the winter the bird had collected had given it away so many crumbs of bread that they equaled in weight the whole loaf which little Inger had stepped upon to keep her shoes clean. When the last crumbs were found and given away, the bird's gray wings became white and spread themselves wide. A turn is flying away over the sea, said the children who saw the white bird. Now it dived into the sea, and now it soared up into the bright sunshine. It gleamed so brightly that it was not possible to see what became of it. They said it flew right into the sun. End of section 18 Recording by Cal Taylor